Welcome to Prevention Is Now. I'm Deb Bonner, preventionist and community advocate for Prairie Center Against Sexual Assault in Springfield, Illinois. Sexual violence is a serious issue facing communities everywhere. It is a crime that impacts all populations regardless of gender or gender identity, sexual orientation, race or ethnicity, age or even economic status. As organizations such as Prairie Center put together our primary prevention plans, we're tasked by the CDC to apply these strategies across the four-level social ecological model of individual relationships community, and societal levels. Now, at the societal level, the strategy involves promoting social norms, policies, and laws that support sexual freedom, rights, and healthy relationships. To discuss prevention efforts at that societal norm on a national front is Terry Poor, the policy director for the National Alliance to End Sexual Violence. Now, according to the organization's website, the NAESV educates the policy community about federal laws, legislation, and appropriations impacting the fight to end sexual violence. Its team of experts and advocates track legislation, provide media interviews, and advise members of Congress and the executive branch. Now, just a few of the organization's accomplishments include leading advocacy efforts to pass the 2013 reauthorization of the Violence Against Women Act, including historic policies to address sexual assault and support underserved survivors, successfully advocating for the first federal funding source specifically to fund services for sexual assault survivors, the Sexual Assault Services Program in 2005, and secured yearly increases in appropriations for sexual assault services programs, including an $8 million increase in fiscal year 2011 when most social service programs were being cut. Terry, welcome to the program. Thank you. Glad to be here. Uh, So needless to say, (laughs) you've had your hands full. And uh, each state has its own sexual violence laws and policies. However, NAESV says even as states are working within their own framework, a national response is still required. Uh, Why is that and what would a national response look like? Sure. It's so interesting with the uh, anti-sexual violence movement. Many of the beginning frameworks for how to respond to the problem were sort of federal and federal funding sources. So we do believe in federal, state, and obviously local responses um, to this problem. But the federal funding sources have been absolutely vital to making sure we have a cohesive response nationally. In fact, the Rape Prevention and Education Program was in the first Violence Against Women Act passed in the early 90s. um, And that was really because of the visionary work of leaders in the anti-sexual violence movement at the time who saw both the need to focus on the issue of sexual violence and the importance of focusing on it through the lens of prevention. So, you know, it's a pretty long-standing federal program that focuses on preventing sexual violence. So we just think it's imperative that every level of government, federal, state, local, um, have a commitment and be part of the solution to preventing sexual violence. NAESV has also created a list for the new administrative priorities for addressing the needs of sexual assault survivors uh, for the administration's first 100 days. One of those top priorities is expanding the Rape Prevention and Education Program, RPE, which you previously mentioned, and support the leadership of state and territorial sexual assault coalitions. What expansions are you or expansions are you looking for specifically and how are you trying to accomplish that? So with the Rape Prevention and Education Program, what we see so clearly is this is a program that came from the field, that came from, from programs like Prairie CASA and the Illinois Coalition Against Sexual Assault, really recognizing the need in their communities to prevent sexual violence. And so those issues were brought forward to Congress to say, we really need a program to prevent sexual violence. And so Those concepts really came from the expertise of the field, through the leadership of the field, and that program was created at the CDC. Since that time, I think we've all learned a lot about primary prevention. We've learned a lot about the, um, we've really grown the evidence around what works to prevent sexual violence. But at the same time, we think that on the ground sort of expertise, people that work day in and day out, think about sexual violence day in and day out in their communities, bringing that expertise to the table is, is critically important. So we want to do a couple of things. One of them is we want to increase the funding that's available for the rape prevention and education program. So, you know, we know that many communities across the country, there, you know, there's a few funded RPE sites around the state, but that there are many areas of um, the country that lack the availability of an RPE educator or preventionist. And we want to really expand that because we know that from the growing evidence base that prevention works, that we can prevent sexual violence. 
Um, and so we really want all communities to have access to that. So I mentioned before the Rape Prevention and Education Program is authorized in the Violence Against Women Act. The Violence Against Women Act is up for reauthorization right now, as I'm sure many of your listeners are aware. So we are working to reauthorize that program. And in there, we want to increase the authorization for the Rape Prevention and Education Program, which is currently $50 million dollars to $150 million to really try and broaden the availability of prevention across the country. You know, 20 or so years ago when folks were working on with funding from RPE, people were trying to get in schools, they were trying to have conversations with leaders, and they got a lot of pushback, like, I'm not sure we want to talk about sexual violence, those sorts of things. I really feel like in many ways, not every problem is solved, but times have changed from the Me Too movement, to high-profile cases of sexual violence, to really looking at the problems of sexual violence in the military and and faith institutions and on campuses and, and the need to have a systemic response. We're really seeing a bigger demand for prevention than before. I think people get the importance of talking about this issue. And with the increased demand, you know, funding just really hasn't kept pace. So we're really looking for an increase in the authorization of the Rape Prevention and Education Program through the Violence Against Women Act. But at the same time, we know once a program is authorized, it also has to be appropriated. It's great for Congress to say, we'd love for this program to have this much money, but it's really a completely separate process to then get actual cash for it. So we really want to increase the appropriation for the Rape Prevention and Education Program as well. And currently in our in our FY22 appropriations work, we start now to try and advocate for FY22 appropriations and that fiscal year will start next October 1st. We're asking for $75 million in appropriated funds for Rape Prevention and Education Programs. So programs like yours can um, expand the reach of what you're doing and so that new programs can get funding. Especially with 2020 being the strange year that it was, uh, those of us who are preventionists and work in the field, we had to do so much reinventing of, of how we were getting our messages out and how we were doing that and what new technologies we were going to use. And that all does come with a price tag. You just don't all of a sudden say, I'm going to start podcasting or I'm going to start all my education online and I'm going to create this online library. So we've definitely seen some very interesting challenges over the past year. That's so true, Deborah. Everything in our professional and personal lives has really changed. We've had to learn how to change so much to virtual. I mean, I do think sexual violence prevention lends itself to some really great work done in the virtual arena, this podcast being a great example of that. But you're absolutely right, getting up to speed with all those technologies and how to change, you know, how we approach this work does absolutely have a price tag. And we don't want to lose the expertise as we, you know, as we learn more about sexual violence prevention, it's you know, situated more in the public health context. We don't want to lose that on the ground expertise of local programs and state coalitions. And so that's the other goal is just that we want to really put into statute the idea that the folks that are the experts in sexual violence are part of the strategic planning around RPE in every state. So couldn't agree with you more. And I do think there's a, a time of great opportunity for re-envisioning how we do so many things, including prevention. And I think in some ways, there are pieces that as soon as we can, we'll want to go back to doing in person. And there are other things we've learned like could be done just as well or, or better sometimes using technology. I know for our organization, uh, we serve 11 counties here in central Illinois, and that's that's a lot of ground to cover. And some of them are fairly rural and fairly sparsely populated. So it's definitely easier, I think, for some organizations to take advantage of meeting via Zoom as opposed to having to drive into Springfield or, you know, wherever, you know, we also have offices in Jacksonville and Taylorville. So it's it's definitely made our services more accessible to people. That makes so much sense. I started in a, a local dual program in North Florida. We served in a giant eight county area, rural area. And you just know that there's a bigger focus on the places with the population centers, right? And that sometimes those more rural areas don't get access. So I think you're absolutely right that technology 
maybe holds the promise of, of making sure people that haven't been reached do get reached. Now, you also had a list of executive branch actions and agency-specific recommendations. Among those, talking about rolling back Betsy DeVos's changes to Title IX. What changes are you hoping to see enacted there? I mean, there are so many <laughs> that we'd like yeah. to see change. But what are some of your primary focuses? We've been really concerned about the limits of the new Title IX rule that went through under the past administration and Betsy DeVos around, especially you know, really separating the idea of social violence that happens on campus, which can be such a limited environment from those that happen to students more generally who are students of a school and student on student sexual violence. And so I think, and especially now with everything being so much more in the virtual world, I think it's going to be so important. Like oftentimes Students attending classes aren't even technically on campus, right? They might be in their apartment or something like that. And so we really think it's really important to step away from the idea that the school's responsibility to respond is only in this really super narrow set of circumstances, whether it's a campus or a K-12 school, that it's just something that happens specifically on campus that a school is responsible for. And then we think it's so critical that students be able to get accommodations, survivors get accommodations in the K-12 and higher ed environment to, you know, make it more possible to continue their education. So if they're in class with somebody who has um, hurt them, that they can change classes, that they can get a break if they need to attend a medical appointment or or a counseling appointment. So that And that those be, you know, less narrowly construed so that survivors don't have to be going through some sort of process to make sure that they can get the accommodations they need. And then we're also seeing that in this environment, like, obviously, live hearings are difficult in the Title IX context. And so we were always concerned about the idea of a live cross, um, that a lot of pressure for both the um, the respondent and the victim to be um, represented puts a lot of pressure sometimes on students. Um, and so all those sorts of pieces of the Title IX rule, we're really hoping that this new administration will back off of. We know it's going to take a little time to promulgate a new rule, but we think it's a great time for advocates to be weighing in about what they're seeing as um, the needs of survivors in this context. I know, too, that schools are super worried about how do we, you know, it's so much is changing about what the what the rules are and what their responsibilities are. And so we really hope that um, the Biden administration is going to be able to come out with some information in soon about, you know, we know change a rule process takes a long time, but at least some sort of interim guidance around what their expectations are um, before an entire rule process. We're speaking with Terry Poor, the policy director for the National Alliance to End Sexual Violence. And Terry, as we've been discussing, we do have that new administration in power with diametrically different views on gender issues than the previous one. And in January, President Biden and Vice President Harris announced the White House Gender Policy Council. And on Instagram, I noticed you guys said you were looking forward to working with the council Council on Sexual Violence Issues. Are there any specific policies that you're working with them on currently, or is it just kind of a, a hope that we're going to get there? Yeah, and so as you can imagine, the, the, the startup for the new administration is taking a little bit of time. Not, I mean, they're moving very, very, very quickly, right? But they appointed the co-chairs of that Gender Policy Council, Jen Klein and Julissa Reynoso. So, and we've already interfaced some with with Jen Klein, I feel like they're going to be really interested. We we think, too, that there will be a gender-based violence position on that council. And so we're waiting. We expect news any day now about a position and a person that will be focused on those issues. And we're really excited about working with them. Um, so we know as they take a minute to get up and running that, we will be, um, again, and I'm very excited to be working closely with the administration on a whole range of issues. One of the things we're pushing for is a special advisor on sexual violence at HHS. We feel like HHS is a place where a lot of stuff is going to be happening over the next um, four years that's important to survivors and that we really feel like that expertise at HHS is going to be really important. So we've talked to the Gender Policy Council and asked for help with that. And then we're also going to want their help with the reauthorization of the Violence Against Women Act. Um, And we've also been working a lot on the Victims of Crime Act VOCA program and legislation to really increase 
deposits into that program because we know that that is a program that so many local programs rely on to provide victim services, certainly rape crisis centers and sexual assault programs, but also domestic violence programs, mothers against drunk driving programs, homicide survivors, just a broad range of victim services is funded through VOCA. So we'll also be talking to them about the importance of supporting legislation to increase deposits to the VOCA fund. So those are the, some of the um, first pieces. And also we're really excited that in the relief package that's moving through the House now and will go on to the Senate, it's, it's moving through the House in a process called reconciliation that folks might have heard from in the news that we've got $198 million in relief funding for um, local sexual assault programs in that bill. So that's super exciting. And we're also going to be asking um, the Gender Policy Council to really help us get that done, help us get that money out to the field as quickly as possible. So I imagine sort of interfacing with that Gender Policy Council in so many different ways, getting the Violence Against Women Act reauthorized, um, and sort of looking across agencies, whether it's HHS, as I mentioned, the Department of Justice, HUD, and the housing needs of survivors, just really looking through throughout the administration at ways we can really respond to the problem of sexual violence services and prevention. Now, you guys are just working on so many pieces of legislation at the NAESV, and I just want to mention a few of them, and I'm going to let you just kind of expand on those issues. What are they, you know, and why are these bills so important? And I know really at the top of the list is that reauthorization of the Violence Against Women Act. Yeah, so the the Violence Against Women Act is reauthorized every, well, theoretically every five years. When it's reauthorized, it's for a period of five years. It's been expired now for I don't know exactly how long, maybe it's going on a couple of years now. Um, you know, I don't want that to panic anybody because programs can still, programs that belong to VAWA, like the Sexual Assault Services Program, like the STOP program, can still be appropriated even if the bill has expired. But we are really trying to, it's really important to reauthorize those programs as a sign from Congress that these things are really important. And so, you know, a core piece of what we're doing when reauthorizing VAWA is looking at, you know, reauthorizing the programs that are at the heart of VAWA. I already mentioned the Sexual Assault Services Program, the Rape Prevention and Education Program, the STOP Program, and many other grant programs are part of VAWA. So we're excited about reauthorizing those and not just reauthorizing them, but increasing the amount that's authorized for those programs and also making, we're always making improvements. Um, So those, that's part of really the core. But also part of what we do with reauthorization of the Violence Against Women Act is we look at, like, where do we need to go farther in public policy to respond to the problems of sexual assault, domestic violence, dating violence, stalking? And so some of the priorities, I think, for all of us in this iteration of BAWA are really going farther for vulnerable survivors. So really investing in culturally specific programs that reach racial and ethnic minority communities really going farther around the issue of tribal sovereignty so that tribes can hold responsible um, non-native offenders of that people that come on to tribal lands and commit a sexual assault or commit child abuse but aren't members of the tribe that tribes can hold those folks responsible we really believe in that um, that we have the protections that immigrant survivors need and that LGBTQ survivors need. So we're definitely looking at those issues. We work, the National Alliance to End Sexual Violence works in a broader coalition called the National Task Force to End Sexual and Domestic Violence. And together, we're re- always really looking at where where does VAWA need to go next to make sure that we are meeting the needs of all survivors. So that's something we're doing. And your listeners might be interested, too, that, you know, the new chair of the Senate Judiciary Committee committee is Senator Durbin from Illinois. Um, and so we're working closely with his staff on the Violence Against Women Act. So Illinois will have like a sort of a, a key role in that work this year. And so we're getting off the ground on both the House and Senate side on that reauthorization. Another piece of legislation you're looking at is the Hold Accountable and Lend Transparency on Campus Sexual Violence Act. What is is that act? Yeah, that's looking at a number of issues related to sexual violence in the education setting. And one of the things that that bill looks at, and it's going to be filed again in this Congress probably pretty soon by Representative Speer from California, 
that really looks at, among other issues, um, the importance of campus climate surveys. So really the importance of understanding what is the problem of sexual violence on a certain campus, giving survivors a chance to talk about their experiences so that we have an uh, try to have an accurate picture of the problem so that we can come up with good solutions. As you know, like oftentimes data around sexual violence is very difficult because many survivors don't necessarily report or come forward. So I think we see these campus climate surveys as a way to get at that problem. Also, like giving survivors the ability to seek financial recourse if they are sexually assaulted and a variety of other pieces. So that's a pretty comprehensive piece of legislation, and we do expect that to be filed again pretty soon. Now, does that look specifically at college campuses, or is it just a broader educational campus that might include the, the K-12? through You know, it has looked, that bill had looked specifically at campuses, but there's discussions now of expanding it to include K-12. I think there's a growing understanding that we can't just relegate our conversations about sexual violence in an education setting to the campus environment. That's kind of where the big impetus started for looking at the problem of sexual violence in education through the lens of Title IX. But there's a lot of energy to really expand that to look at K-12. And so I think I I would expect to maybe see those issues be covered as well in the Halt Act. Bringing an end to harassment by enhancing accountability and rejecting discrimination in the Workplace Act or the Be Heard Act or Be Heard in the Workplace Act. What's going on with that? Yeah. So, I mean, there, there are so many different sort of trends and interest areas, sort of how, how to solve this really broad problem of sexual violence. And as you've seen that through the Me Too movement and the formation of Time's Up and all those sorts of pieces that there's been a real focus on how do we tackle the problem of sexual harassment in the workplace. Um, And so the Empower Act is really looking at that issue. How how do we go about really getting at that problem, really making sure that people aren't, um, their hands aren't tied by um, agreements that they make when they're first employed, you know, non-disclosure agreements and those different contractual pieces that would prevent them from seeking recourse later on, and those sorts of things that that really seek to make the workplace fairer and more responsive to the problems of sexual harassment in the workplace. So I really feel like we've just scratched the surface on everything that you're working on. Is there anything else you'd like to add before we wrap things up? Well, um, let's see. Well, we're really just so hopeful that we get accomplished this relief funding for local programs. So be watching the relief packages. Love to see some funding getting out to local programs to help with, just as you said in the beginning, Deborah, there's a a price tag with um, transitioning to virtual services. And we know, although programs have come a long way, that there's work left to do. So we're hoping that will help. Um, And stay tuned for um, more information about how to influence the FY22 appropriation season. And final question, where can people find out more about the work you do and how they can get involved? Sure. Well, you can visit us on social media. We tweet quite a bit at End SXL Violence. And you can visit our website at endsexualviolence.org. And we also have a public policy listserv called Sexual SA Policy Watch, Sexual Assault Policy Watch. You can join that through our website as well. And we send alerts and things through that system. Um, We'd love to have you join our work. And I know you're already an integral part of it if you're listening to this. And I just want to say how grateful I am to advocates who um, work day in and day out to prevent sexual violence, to meet the needs of survivors, and we're so grateful for your work. Terry Porge, Policy Director for the National Alliance to End Sexual Violence, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you so much for having me. I really appreciate it. This has been Prevention Is Now. I'm Deb Bonner, preventionist and community advocate for Prairie Center Against Sexual Assault. If you'd like more information on this program, you may call our offices at 217-744-2560 or send me an email requesting more information at dbonner at prairiecasa.org. Prairie Center Against Sexual Assault supports children and adult survivors of sexual violence through counseling and legal and medical advocacy in 11 central Illinois counties. We also offer bystander intervention training with bringing in the bystander and coaching boys into men and sexual harassment prevention training for businesses and organizations in our area. Our main office is located in Springfield, Illinois with satellite offices in Jacksonville and Taylorville, Illinois. And you can find out more about our services at our website at prairiecasa.org. This program is supported by a grant from the Illinois Department of Public Health and the Illinois Coalition Against Sexual Assault. Points of view or opinions contained in this program are those 
those of Prairie Center Against Sexual Assault and our guests and do not necessarily reflect the official positions or policies of these grantors. Thank you for listening.